All right, good morning, everyone. Um, if you guys open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians, I know, after two long years of going through the book of Colossians, we're going to start a new book this morning. And um, I'm really, really excited to go through this book. I think this book has a lot of great practical application. Um, as we've always said, the Word of God has always been relevant and always will be relevant. And I think as we go through 1 Thessalonians, we're going to see that this book is becoming more and more relevant um, as time goes on. And um, we're going to see the theme this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about the writer. We obviously know who the writer is. And um, just talk a little bit about the details of this book and what to expect as we go through it. So this morning is just going to be more of an introduction to the book. Um, but the overall theme of the book, and we'll say it later on as well, is the theme of the book of First Thessalonians is hope. And it's mentioned in every single chapter. It's composed of five chapters, and every single chapter addresses hope. And uh, so I'm really, really excited. So if you guys open your Bibles, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, let's just read through a few verses here before we get started. Verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So um, right off the bat, I mean, we're going to get into some really great stuff of talking about it. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about the introduction. Who was the writer of the timing and the writing of First Thessalonians, because I think it helps it fit into the context a little bit of where we're at. The writer is obviously going to be the Apostle Paul. We see that the first word there is Paul, and he addresses all of his letters by starting off with who he is. And um, what we're going to see is, as we mentioned, it's going to be a very practical letter that he's writing to the church of the Thessalonians. At this point, Paul had been traveling extensively for about eight years. I'm not I'm not a historian. I'm not going to say I'm very accurate with my timing. But Paul had been in his journeyings and travelings for... He wasn't just one year into it. Also, I, what I want to say is, is that some people teach the Thessalonians was the first letter that Paul wrote. I mean, it could be either way. I'm personally going to fall on the side of that Galatians was the first epistle that the Apostle Paul penned. And we're going to talk a little bit about why I believe that. So go with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And that's not to say, by the way, 1 Thessalonians was probably written very, very close to Galatians, not too far after, but I think Galatians came a little bit before that. So Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> and uh, look at verse 1. Galatians chapter 2. And verse 1, he says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So we we're going to see some mention of different people. Go to verse 9. He says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they under the circumcision. Verse 13 and the other Jews dissembled likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Um, Barnabas here is mentioned three times, which is going to fit in with Paul's first missionary journey, or apostolic journey, whatever we want to address it as, his first traveling of his extensive traveling. Um, it, we also notice in verse 1 through 5, look at 1 through 5, he mentions here, he says, In 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them 
which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So this fits best before the Jerusalem Council, which took place in Acts chapter 15, which would be another reason why Galatians came before 1 Thessalonians. And the mention of Peter would be another. I guess I'm not clicking this. Sorry, guys. The mention of Peter in verse 11 of Galatians chapter 2, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them, I like what Paul does there, by the way. Paul sees an issue, and what does he do? He's going to go and address it directly to the person. He's not going to go and say, hey, Timothy, come over here. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Over, Look at what Peter's doing. No, he says, I went and I addressed the issue. Went and took care of it. And he goes on and he says, And I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not the sinners of the Gentiles. So he's addressing those issues, and that's, best be, that's right around before the Jerusalem Council. And the last point it would be in Acts chapter 20. Go with me to Acts chapter 20. Just trying to get through this quickly. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> and Des already spent some time on this, by the way, of these issues when he was going through some of the chronological order of Paul's epistles. So Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> and look at verse 4. It says, And there were accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secondus, and Gaius of Derb, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. Troph 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 so what we see is, is that money was taken to Jerusalem. Several companions of Paul from different, different areas were listed. This would fall in making the timing of the book of Galatians before 1 Thessalonians. Now I can take a breath, okay? So basically what I'm saying is, is I think that 1 Thessalonians was the second epistle that Paul wrote. So it's very early on in his ministry compared to the book that we just went through in the book of Colossians. But what we're going to see is, is that a lot of the things that we see mentioned throughout all of Paul's epistles is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians. And so that shows, it's not to say that Paul came to full understanding by 1 Thessalonians, but we see a lot of the doctrine, a lot of the working that takes place in this epistle of 1 Thessalonians. We see it throughout the theme of the rest of Paul's epistles. So go with me to Acts chapter 17 with that said. Acts chapter 17 and a little, just a brief background, Thessalonica wasn't a small city. All right? Thessalonica was a very, very large city, and it's said to have about over 200,000 people. So this was a massive, a big area. Okay? And so <clears throat> it's also said to have been the capital city of the Roman province of Macedonia. And so we see... We read in chapter 1 just a little bit of the context, how they received the word in much affliction, and then they sounded out the word of the Lord in Macedonia and Achaia, which would be the region. How we can relate to that would be, we live, my wife and I live in South Daytona, Florida, which resides in Volusia County, which resides in the state of Florida. So the county is a much larger area than the little city of South Daytona of where we live. Thessalonica was in this area of Macedonia. So, just something to think about over that. The birth, I guess you would say, of this church, the place of where it was founded, we can see here, we're in Acts chapter 17. What's cool about going back and forth in the book of Acts and the study that we've been doing in the book of Acts on Wednesday nights here is, is that it brings in a little more perspective 
of Paul's relationship with some of these churches. And so Paul, we said in the book of Colossians, he wasn't, he wasn't the guy to go down there and start the church. We see here, though, Paul is at Thessalonica. He's going to be the guy that's there that helps start the ministry there. Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is who? Christ. So he's going in, first thing he does is, and it says it was after his manner, what does he do? He doesn't go around and just hang out with a bunch of people. He goes straight where? Synagogue. And what's he going to do? He's going to now proclaim that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. What do we have to do when we share the gospel? We have to s declare Jesus Christ is who? Son of God. You can't just say, believe in Jesus. We have to understand who he is. So Paul was going and doing that. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, by the way, immediately all of them went and they spent about three weeks explaining who Jesus Christ was. Think about that. Three weeks of doing that. We go on. Verse 4. And some of them, what? Believed. Now, it doesn't say all of them. It doesn't say many of them. It says what? Some of them believed. So some of the Jews believed and began to associate themselves with Paul. And what we're going to understand later on is, is that a lot of the... Let's read on. He says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a what? Great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. So we see many people there believed, many prominent women in the area believed, the Greeks of the Jews, what? Some. Verse 5. But the Jews which believed not moved with great love. No. What did they move with? Envy. And it, and it was a deep hatred, jealousy. They're seeing Paul and these people believing and, and they're moved not the way they should have been. And it says, And they were moved with envy and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. This, it, it, what's funny about that is, is you, these are supposed to be the most prominent people. And what do they do? They go and grab the baser sort, the, the, the dirt bags, the guys that are not good, and they bring them and say, all right, we're going to use these guys. So rather than consorting and being about with the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Silas, they say, no, we're going to go grab these guys. And then it says, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. This doesn't sound very good, does it? And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither what? So that tells us, reading that, that they've already heard about what some of the things that Paul and Silas and Timothy were preaching. Because he says, these are the guys that's turning the world upside down. Now they're here. Verse 7. Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they did what? They let them go. So the unbelieving jurors, Jews stir up the city. They cause a mob scene. They drag Jason and many other believers before the rulers and basically want to charge them with treason. They're not saying, by the way, that Caesar is not king. They're saying that Jesus the Christ is king. Big difference. Jesus himself, when he stood before Pilate, recognize Pilate's leadership and authority. And he said that your authority comes from God. He didn't say you have zero authority. He said your authority comes from God. And so these people weren't causing uproar saying we need to overthrow Caesar. They were saying Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But they didn't like that. Verse 10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. 
And so the period of time from in Acts 17 was possibly several months. Paul escapes to Berea, and then he goes on to Athens. And Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Go with me back to 1 Thessalonians. But let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. You think about that. What a crazy time. They go in and they're preaching. All they're preaching, by the way, is Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. And what do they want to do with them? Take them before and say, we need to get rid of these guys. Who was the one really causing the scene? It was the unbelieving Jews. It wasn't Paul and his friends. It was the unbelieving Jews causing the scene. It doesn't say that Paul and Silas and Timothy went and got a mob together and caused an uproar in the city. It says that these guys did that. Look at um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 in verse 1. It says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to do what? To establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Paul knew these guys were just saved. These are not going to be mature believers. He knew he was going to have to send someone, so he's, he's entrusted Timothy, by the way, to send Timothy back to do what? Help establish this church. Because they just were saved. Maybe it was a few months of time that they were there, and that's not enough time, by the way. So Timothy goes back to establish them and comfort them. What a job Timothy had, by the way. He has to go back to the city they just had to sneak out of by night. And now he's going back. Timothy had a great faith to do that. That should be, I think that's encouraging to us. When Paul and Timothy and Silas meet up again together, they are, not, they are going to be at the area of Corinth. And that's going to be, that's in Acts chapter 18. Timothy brings a report to Paul about the state of the church and it's from there that Paul is going to write I believe 1 Thessalonians because he's going to write them a letter to encourage them so that brings us now that's the timing it's the order who wrote it when was it written how did, Thess how did the church get started there now we're going to talk about what is the theme of 1 Thessalonians and we said before 1 Thessalonians is going to deal a lot about the doctrine of the coming of Jesus Christ. A lot of times we refer to it as the rapture. We know the word rapture is not used in the Bible, but when someone says it, we know what they mean. The catching away, that term is used in the Bible. Look at a few verses with me. We're going to go through each chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and look at verse 9. It says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how he turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from where? Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from what? The wrath to come. What an important verse in our Bibles. There are so many people that teach we are not going to be delivered from the wrath to come. How sad is that? To say that we're not going to be delivered from the wrath to come is to say that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to bear the wrath of God again. He bore the wrath of God where? On the cross. It was bore there. He's not going to bear it again. Chapter 2. Go to chapter 2 with me in verse 19. Paul says, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, where? At his coming. For ye are our glory and joy. Go to chapter 3 in verse 13. Chapter 3 in verse 13, it says, look at verse 12. It says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another and towards all men, even as we do towards you, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the what? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with who? All his saints. And who is that? The wonderful thing is, is that's us, all of us. Chapter 4, verse, 
We know the verses here very well. In uh, verse 13, he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that he sorrow not, even as others which what? Have no hope. So he's saying to us, we have what? Hope. But the unbeliever has no hope. You know, and I think about when you read, we're getting ready to read through this, how do people go through life without hope? It's sad. You know, it's like you start to think, it's like, how do you go today, you had a terrible day, how do you go into tomorrow with no hope? And in verse 14, he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. By the way, the sleep there doesn't mean, we're, we'll talk about it eventually when we get there. That is not soul sleep. That's just talking about people that are dead. All right, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be where? With the Lord. And then he says in verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Talk about our hope. What is our hope? The ones that we've known, our loved ones, our people that are close to us, that have died, that have been saved, guess what? We're going to see them again. We have the blessed hope to look forward to. If we're alive and remain, we're going to be what? It says we're going to be caught up together with them in the air. And it says that we, as believers, are going to be with the Lord for how long? Forever. That's our hope. Chapter 5 and verse 23. <clears throat> he says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto when? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. So you see the coming of the Lord, being in the presence of the Lord, our hope mentioned where? Every single chapter in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And he's going to describe to us, when we go through it, details in that. So I think a key, the key verse, and I mean there can be multiple key verses in the book of 1 Thessalonians, I think that the key verse here that we're going to talk about through Thessalonians is chapter 5 and verse 23 where he's going to conclude that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. I think that's going to be our key verse of talking as we go through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And um, what's awesome is, is that we're going to learn and discuss three things early on in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and it's going to carry that theme throughout the whole book. We're going to see that this church here had the work of faith. And we're going to see how this church also had the labor of love. And we're going to see how this church had the patience of hope. And what those things were doing was it was working in the midst. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, we're going to get to, talks about how the Word of God effectually works in us. That what? Believe. This church believed it, and they had the three things that 1 Corinthians 13 discusses and says is going to abide for today, which is what? Faith. Hope and charity, which is love. And this church had it. This church had it on display. This church was getting on with the work. And Paul talks about how they received the word, and they received the word in much affliction, but they were getting on with the work. How do you continue to have the work of faith and labor of love? What is going to sustain the believer? Our hope. The patience of hope. And so that's what we're going to discuss as we go through this whole book of 1 Thessalonians is is to focus on our patience of hope, the work of faith, labor of love. Paul outlines that right in the beginning, and it's going to carry throughout the whole book. So that brings us to verse 1. We'll at least talk about verse 1 today. Okay? And 
1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, <clears throat> Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, what's interesting is, is in all of Paul's letters, he does what at the beginning? He's like, hey guys, you know who's writing? How do we know? Puts his name there. And we see that. Although Paul mentions Silas and Timothy, he does that as, hey, these are the guys that are with me currently as I'm writing this letter. And, and, and Paul, as he wrote his letters, he didn't physically always pick up a pen and pin down all of the letters. Sometimes the guys with him helped write it. Because why? Well, we learn that 2 Corinthians, Paul has an ailment with his eye. We also can see in 2 Corinthians how many times Paul was beaten. When a person is beaten physically that many times, they get nerve damage. When you have nerve damage, your hand does what? It shakes. So if his hand is shaky, that means he's not going to be able necessarily to pen it. Now the guy that's there, he's telling him what to write down. And what does the guy do? He doesn't go and say, really, you want to use that word, Paul? Come on. No, he writes it down. Okay? And we see the same thing. God has, by the way, done that throughout his whole word. Had other, he spoke to Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke to Baruch, and he pinned it down into Scripture. And he had to do, by the way, all of Scripture because it was burned by a king. Okay? So we see that throughout all of Scripture. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at this with me real quick. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And verse 5, he says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be what? Be in vain. He wanted to know their state. And he says, But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by what? Your faith. He's like, I wanted to know your report. And when Timothy came back to us and gave us the report, it brought us comfort. And so that's why Paul is writing this letter. That's why, by the way, Timothy's back with him too. Timothy had already been there. Now he's back with him. We understand that Silvanus, by the way, is also Silas in the book of Acts, when you see him mentioned in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16. And so Paul addresses the whole church. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians. Now let me ask you, was there saved Jews in this church? Yeah, remember, this is early on in Acts. There's going to be a transition, Right? And so, yes, there's some saved Jews and there's Gentiles, so there's a, bunch of, there's a bunch of mixture in the church. And you see that in a lot of Paul's early letters. And so we see that that's going on there. And so the question I ask when we go to this passage is, what then makes them a church? What makes a church? What composes a church? How do we know? Well, Paul says it's the church there. He says, he says, unto the church of the Thessalonians. And I think the key there is, is what he says next, which is in who? God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. So they, what they share is, is a sp spiritual position, and that spiritual position is, is that once we trust the fact that Christ, who is the Son of God, died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, we now are placed where? In Christ, and Christ is where? In God. So that puts us where? In Christ and in God. Does that make sense? And so what composes the church? Us being in Christ and in God. And so this church, though, had a local assembly. We do the same thing today. We have local assemblies. We have local churches. And so we see that. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12 
in verse 12. It says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is who? Christ. For by one Spirit are we who? All baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but what? Many. And so now what he's going to do is, is he's discuss how are we then taken and placed in God? <clears throat> well, it tells us, verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized where? Into one body. So who's the one body? Each and every single one of us. We're the one body. Who's the head of that body? Christ. Colossians theme was what? Christ, the head of the church. We're all placed into that one body. He's the head of that body. There's many members. He goes on and he says, verse 15, and he's going to discuss how we should interact with one another. He says, If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the member, <coughs> excuse me, every one of them in the body, as it hath what? Pleased him. We all are going to have a specific purpose. We are all not going to be the same person. But we all are going to be where? In one body. Now the body is the what? The church. Keep, let's keep reading. He says, in verse 20, he says, But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are what? Necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God had tempered the body, how? Together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked. So he's saying we don't get to decide who stays and who goes. Well, I just, you know, I really, really don't like that person, so they got to get out of here. They can't be a part of the body anymore. But that was going on, by the way, in the church. You know, we were just, I think we were talking Tuesday night at our young adult Bible study, and we, and we were discussing, we were talking about um, something similar to this, that you can't just discard people. You can't just put people away. And it's like, we're so quick sometimes to do that. It's like, that person isn't really doing that myself. I'll just push them to the side. But the, body, the Bible says that as the body of Christ, if we see someone that needs help as the body, what should we do? We help that member. If I get injured, if I break a finger, I don't say, well, I broke my finger, cut it off and get rid of it. What do we do? Well, now the rest of the body is going to help take care of that finger. We're going to go to a doctor most likely, and they're going to do what? Well, not, hopefully not cut it off, okay? Hopefully they're just going to set it and put it back. And then what are they going to do? They're going to put something on it to help hold it in place. And then now for the next few weeks of my life, I'm going to have to do what? When I go to try to open up a door, I need to not use that finger because it's going to hurt. So now what am I doing? The rest of the body's taking care of that one member. When there's a member in the body of Christ struggling, we don't just stand by and say, oh, well, that's your problem. What do we do? We bestow more abundant honor. We help that member. Why? Verse 25 tells us why we should function that way as the body. He says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care. How? One for another. Well, I just really, really, I just really get along with Todd more than other people, so I don't want to be around the other people in the church. That's a terrible attitude to have. We shouldn't do that. He says we should do what? Have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members do what? Suffer with it. 
Sometimes when people are going through a tough time, we kind of want to pull back a little bit because it's like, maybe I'll get into a tough time if I'm around them. You know, I, well, I'm, I'm feeling really good in my life right now, so I, I don't know if I want to deal with their problems. But what does it say? It says, if one member suffers, what do we do? Suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members, what? Rejoice with it. So sometimes someone goes through a big success. And we want to be like, man, that's what they're doing in their life. And it's like, well, we're not rejoicing with them in what they just did. We should be rejoicing with that. And then I like how he finishes and concludes this here. And he says, now ye are the body of who? Christ. He says, this isn't about us looking at our physical body. This is about realizing we're the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what? And members in particular. That is who we are. That's our position. We're members, what? In particular, in where? In the body of Christ. And as being a part of the body of Christ, we are in God. So when we read here in 1 Thessalonians, go back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he's writing here. And it's so quick sometimes to miss things early on. And, he, and he's writing, he says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God, the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were physically in Thessalonica, but spiritually they were where? In God, in Christ. Same things for us. We're meeting this morning in Edgewater, right? So Paul wrote a letter to us. He'd be like to the saints that are in Edgewater, which are where? In God and in Christ. That's who we are. It's not about the building. We've said that before. It's not about this building. Because if it was about the building, we as the body of Christ would be failing. Even if we had a nice building, if you had a million dollar building, it's not about the building, we'd be failing. It's about the members. Are we having the same care one for another? Are we comforting one another? Are we suffering with one another? Are we rejoicing with one another? It doesn't matter where that takes place. It matters, are we doing that? And so Paul greets the church there, reminds them right off the bat, guys are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's who we are. And then he says, and we see this in all of Paul's letters, grace be unto you, and what? Peace from God our Father and who? The Lord Jesus Christ. The message for today is what? Grace and peace. And what a wonderful message it is. Because Paul's going to talk later on about how we've been delivered from the wrath to come. People that don't have hope, by the way, don't have peace. Paul says the message that we have from God the Father and Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ is we have the message of grace and peace. We can rest. Why? Because we have hope. That's what he's going to talk about. We have a sure hope. We said that word hope the word hope, and we'll talk more about it too, doesn't mean that we hope one day we'll be with the Lord. You know, I hope, I really hope it's going to happen. Now, when we say we hope, that means we have confidence, we have a surety, we know. One day, we are going to be in the presence of the Lord. One day, there's going to be no more suffering. We're not going to have to suffer with the body. You know why? Because we're going to be glorified together. We're not going to have to have physical pain and suffering anymore. We're going to be glorified. We're going to have perfect bodies. You know, what a wonderful thing. And, and it's like people are missing out on that. The church of Thessalonica here had it. The work of faith, the labor of love, patience of hope. They had hope. They knew who they were. The message, grace be unto you and peace from God. The world is looking for a grace to make it through the hard times of life, but they look for it in all the wrong places. The world wants peace. You hear all this talk about, oh, world peace, peace in relationships, peace this, peace that. But they're looking in all the wrong places. Grace and peace only can come from God. 
And that's the one place people don't want to look towards. And it's sitting right in front of everyone. And that's why it's our job as believers. You know, we use that term, our job, because Paul used it. He says we need to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. How are we called? God's message to us was what? Grace and peace. What should our message be to the world? Grace and peace. Because wrath is going to come. But today, God is giving what? His grace and his peace. Go with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And he talks about this here as well. And he says in verse 1, he says, Therefore being justified, how? By faith. He says, God doesn't want anything from you. So the only thing that you can do is is take your faith, place it into his faith. That's it. Therefore being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with who? With God. So before... Before we're saved, guess what we don't have? Peace with God. Now, God's message today to all men is is grace and peace. But in order to have peace with God, we have to be first justified by faith. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And the means of how we got that is, is what? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the blood of his cross. By whom also we have access by faith into this what grace wherein guess what we stand are standing and then he says and rejoice in what hope of the glory of god see those key words that paul's always using grace peace love hope why because they're all interconnected they're all a part of that fruit of the spirit talks about that in Galatians 5. The message today is that. Look what he goes on and says in verse 3. And he says, and not only so, but we glory in what? Tribulations. How in the world can you go through the sufferings of this life and you say, I'm going to glory in my infirmities? Someone that faces death. I think Brianna and I were talking about it this week, that we hope if we're ever in a circumstance that we're facing death, that we can stand strong. You know why? Because there's people that's going to be watching. It's amazing when someone can be facing death and say, I have peace. Because the people around them are going to go, what is wrong with you? You're about to die. And say, well, I have peace because I know my hope. And there's been so many people saved because of that. You know, you go to a hospital and the nurses and the doctors are just watching this person. They're facing death right, it's right there. They've got days to live and they, and they don't understand. How can that person sit there with so much peace? Because they have faith, they have hope, they have love. And, it, and he says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience what? Hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is what? given unto us. When is the Holy Ghost, by the way, given unto us? The moment we place our faith in the faith of Christ. We received his grace. We received his peace. We just got to learn about it. And then we got to believe it. We got to trust it. We got to allow it to work in us. That's where we mess it up. (laughs) But it's that easy. (laughs) Sometimes I'm like, man, God, you made it a little too easy. But it had to be so easy because we messed it up. (laughs) So go back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says, Paul and Samanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, 
your what? The election of God. We've been chosen for a specific purpose. Now, we were saved because we trusted the gospel. After we're saved, we've been chosen now to serve him. We are the members of the body of Christ. We are the church. Whether we meet here, whether there's a church in Orlando, whether there's a church in Shorewood, we all meet. We're all members of the body of Christ. Now, he's writing specifically to this church, and we're going to see as we go through this the hope that we have. We know we've received grace and peace, and we know the source of that grace and peace only comes through God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Next time we come together, we're going to start digging into verse 2 and 3 of Paul's prayer there of giving of thanks and making mention, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on verse 3 of the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. I'm excited to teach through this book and study with you guys through this book. I encourage you guys, it's a very, very short, it's actually, it's five chapters, but it's shorter than Colossians. So maybe we'll get through it a little faster, okay? But I encourage you guys, if you can this week, go and just read through the whole book. Don't stop at the verse, just sit there and read through it. You'll just see the context of First Thessalonians is talking about, by the way, some mature believers here and the hope, our hope. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to um, study through this book together and be able to see um, the hope that the church here at Thessalonica had and the hope that we have. And um, thank you for your grace and your peace that's been given to us and your love. And um, may we go out and share that grace and peace with others. It's in Christ's name. Amen.